So welcome to the Digital Economist from the World Economic Forum here in Davos, Switzerland. We are holding our inaugural round table and we're very excited to have a huge turnover and a highly curated round table. Digital Economist is an impact platform focused on thought leadership and bringing investable opportunities in alignment with the Sustainable Development Goals to the fore. So we're very excited to welcome uh, folks on January 23rd this evening and uh, looking forward to a great partnership and a lot of value we create for the community along the way. So welcome. afternoon and evening everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Navroop Sadev and I'm the founder CEO of the Digital Economist, which is a global impact ecosystem uh, that is working towards a human-centered digital economy through its suite of product services and program offerings. We also run a center of excellence on the human-centered digital economy. It currently has two working groups around policy and agility. So we're very excited to have you here today. We, today we're joined by Harald Stieber, this is the second talk in the series of our speaker series, um, and uh, which was kickstarted by uh, Alex Pentland last week. And this is an ongoing initiator of the Digital Economist. Um, and Harold, uh, who's with us, is a senior economist at the European Commission. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, he's working on financial data standards, automation of legal applications, uh, emerging tech, including blockchain technology and digital currencies, among other things. Uh, over the past years, we've had just a very engaging, uh, um, interesting intellectual conversations, both from a theoretical as well as practical perspective. So I'm very happy to welcome you here today, Harold. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Nehru. So uh, I think uh, we can immediately share screen here. So hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Nafrup. Thank you, Avinder. Uh, thanks for having me. And it's a, it's a great honor to speak uh, uh, just a week after uh, Alex Pantland, uh, who I, 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 I know and appreciate very much. And, uh, and you will see that uh, we are a bit, uh, I think we're a bit following in his footstep with uh, this project that we have at the European Commission. Uh, so this is, uh, it is really a social physics project, if you, if, uh, as you will see. And uh, I will I'm stop my clock now here next to, uh, next to my screen to, to look a bit at the time. And uh, we will spend some 25 minutes on um, uh, basically uh, discovering together what, the kind, what kind of questions we are handling here and what kind of uh, approach we take to, to make progress towards answering these questions. So uh, in the first part of the talk, I, I want to walk you through um, uh, and uh, how in the, historically we have tried to measure the economy and how this was very much driven by very practical uh, needs, political motivations really, and how the flow measure such as GDP today has historically been rather the exception uh, than the rule. And uh, part two, uh, we will see, we will dive uh, into, into some of the nitty gritty issues that have probably um, continued to be a challenge for tokenomics uh, for digital representations of value. And I hope we will gain some understanding why we will probably need a quite comprehensive approach to modeling household balance sheets in order to, to overcome some of the uh, uh, the issues that have held uh, to back uh, the, the possible benefits, the, of tokenomics until today. So um, I hope that uh, after this talk, we, uh, we can, I can get some feedback and criticism for you. Maybe there are ideas for collaboration. Um, I think, uh, I hope that uh, all of you that will, that are joining today or will watch the, the talk later uh, offline 
um, become more critical with regards to our, the way we measure the economy and and but also uh, in the end uh, of course we are excited uh, as, as we are here in the digital economist about the opportunity of big data and data technologies uh, to 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 come to better policies uh, in the future to better policy design based on better measurement and maybe we have some fun talking uh, through these issues so um, in, in this first part, I, I really want to um, drive home the message that because measurement historically has been costly and continues to be costly, uh, we tend to measure only what is considered critical for policy design at any point in time uh, or for the implementation or enforcement of policies. So um, these are some screenshots of taken from the internet. So I don't always, or I don't necessarily own the copyright of that. So we will see if we can keep that in the distribution of slides, but uh, I, I really wanted to go back very far to show that, uh, to create a feeling for how much actually we have uh, jumped around between an asset-based measurement system and the flow-based measurement system. And so basically the conflict that we have today with, with GDP or rather looking at uh, wealth is, is, is really a, a topic that has been around uh, human societies for almost for forever, basically, since we have um, um, modern uh, forms of, of a state and, and, and big society, basically. So, um, so it, from old ancient Egypt, we, we know already a, a mix of things where uh, asset measure, measurement was mixed with, with flow and stabilization policies. Uh, something not very well known is that by the time the uh, the um, Roman Empire um, was at, at, its, at its peak. Um, the, uh, there was a modern social security system that was run by the uh, second Jewish temple in Jerusalem. And uh, that was open to non-Jews and had at its peak 11 million members. And it was actually a system that looked very much like our modern social security system in, in, in Europe. Um, uh, also a story that is maybe not uh, generally known is uh, that in the Roman Empire at the later stage, when, you know, the Romans tended to distribute land as, as, as later kings and emperors did uh, as a reward for, for loyalty and, and, and after, after winning a war. But at some point when land became scarce, uh, the Romans actually switched to distributing intangible assets. Uh, such as being the right uh, of, a, of a Roman citizen, which came with very concrete uh, access rights yeah, in terms of writing contracts, enforcing contracts, uh, uh, your, your status in, 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 in the, in when, when, when you are a student in court, etc. Actually, the right to be to, 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 to due process, we would call it today. Uh, later on, we had another uh, um, example of a asset-based uh, economic measurement, the Doomsday Book, here it was a classical case of redistributing the land. Um, then uh, what is really interesting is uh, around, uh, between the 14th and the, and the 16th century, we had a, a whole range of, of revolutions uh, that, that um, are, to me, really uh, precursors of the discussion we have today around smart contracts and digital assets. Uh, we had a, a, a mix of uh, a, a strong reduction in contract uh, um, copy, copy and enforcement costs by, by the printing press um, that, that was not really, um, the printing press as such was not new, the, the movable types were not new, the Chinese had it for 500 years, but the Gutenberg press had lowered the cost of, of printing enormously uh, by, I don't know, a factor of 100 or so. And, um, and then uh, we had um, um, enforcement mechanisms that were uh, changing enormously the, the, the cost of contracting um, by uh, really having written contracts considered as um, non-disputable. So um, you see this in the, in the version of Christopher Marlowe uh, of the Dr. Faust legend. Dr. Faust in Christopher Marlowe's version says the, the contract terms must be adhered to. So they're, they're, they, you cannot renegotiate. You, you, what, is, what is in the, in the bond contract you know, it has to be honored. So this is really a change here. And of course, Max Weber has uh, talked about this, um, this period later on uh, in his Protestant ethics, uh, how basically uh, self-enforcement by, by values, by attitudes, uh, can lower the cost of transaction and can allow basically much more trades to take place as if you always relied on a third party 
uh, to enforce contracts. So this sounds very much, of course, like, uh, like smart contracts, right? An early form of smart contracts. Then, then it goes uh, further on with an um, asset-based uh, cadaster in uh, William Petty's uh, survey. Uh, later on, the physiocrats in France uh, propose a, a circular flow economy that looks much more like uh, after Second World War uh, Western style economy. And then eventually we come, of course, to the birth of modern economics with Adam Smith. And here, uh, the point that is crucial for our discussion is that uh, Smith uh, was emphasizing, uh, of course, specialization, but he was emphasizing that the economy takes place against the background of a particular set of, of property rights. Uh, so he, he did not, uh, uh, he did not ex exclude uh, assets and intangible assets from his view of the economy. Quite the contrary, he only, he only uh, set them, basically, he, he, he left them constant because he was not able to measure them in his day. So, but he was very much aware of them and he, he, um, he insisted on this point that what we measure in terms of production and specialization, it always has to be seen um, as taking place in, 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 within a certain set of property rights and of, and of course taxation. And then of course we move to present day economics and there you really see that after the second world war, when we start to in, when we invented the GDP concept, uh, the GDP was really very much uh, answering the needs of macro modelers. And the macro modelers had switched to uh, a view of the economy really based on income flows after the second world war. And already before the second world war during the great depression, um, because um, at the time, this was really um, the, the, the state of the art, how to, how to uh, link uh, the modeling of the economy to policy making. And so the, the measurement was really developed in tandem and it, it very much uh, replied to the needs from, of, of macro modelers. And, and there we got stuck a, a bit, uh, if, if you want, with this focus on income flows and the assets that played such a big role historically in, 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 in the thousands of years of, of modern society before that uh, got a bit, uh, so to say, on, on the back burner, burner. But now, of course, they're coming back again uh, and as we go to a digital representation of asset. So how can we reap the full benefits of digital representations of value and in including uh, those intangible assets that, are, that we carry with us, that are our rights and freedoms, and so that we cannot trade them directly because trading them directly would mean basically a form of slavery. So in, 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 in Western society, this is ruled out. You're, you're not allowed to, to trade, uh, to trade your, yourself as a, uh, as, a, as a commodity in the marketplace. What what a what a what a uh, what a firm actually that hires you uh, uh, does with in relation to your assets is not that it it, it does not own you, it rather buys uh, it buys a certain exclusivity uh, that uh, it excludes you from having um, uh, trades with with other firms in particular with competitors, but it, it never owns you. That would be completely unacceptable in in in, in our. Um, Western value value uh, system. So I found uh, here this uh, this this um, quote from David Hume quite astonishing, uh, given that he has written this in, in 1748, uh, because he had already very strongly a network view of the economy. And so so you see it in this quote. It, it, he stresses the mutual dependence of our uh, what we do in, 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 in the economy, in the marketplace, but also in our private life and how the value of what we do and the value of what we can achieve uh, always depends on, on others and how we interact with others. And then a bit later, uh, John R. Commons, who is one of the founders of, of, the, of the law and economics tra tradition, uh, he, he pushes this a bit further as he analyzes the, the, the changing view of what is property in the jurisprudence of the US Supreme Court. And he emphasizes that really um, the individual has always uh, uh, several um, um, types of, of, of relations. Of course, the individual is a buyer and a seller, but is also a creditor and a debtor. We have, uh, uh, and we are not only in this relationship with a bank, we are also in this relationship with our friends and family 
and 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 in our in our business networks, etc. We are of course competitors, but we are also governors and governed. And all these um, relations matter for uh, the 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 value that our um, social capital, that uh, a term that uh, Bob Putnam of, of Harvard has created in 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 bowling alone, um, and um, and of course these the value of these assets it very much depends on uh, the roles we play in these different uh, types of relationships. I will skip that a bit in the interest of time, uh, but uh, if you are more interested in that, I can I can really recommend to uh, to go to uh, Commons original public um, the legal foundations of capitalism and this discussion of how uh, the the 13th of the 14th amendment has led uh, to a to a really broadening of, of, of our view of what constitutes property um, is really fascinating and very much the basis for the project that uh, I run in here in the European Commission. So basically a balance sheet could look uh, uh, like this. Uh, we currently do not really have this. We have uh, incomplete balance sheets where some of these uh, items are, are being measured today using standard statistical tools, not really digital asset uh, view or, or big data, but rather surveys, uh, more traditional. But we do not measure all of this. For example, when, when you look on the, on the asset side, of course, social capital here, uh, again, as, as Bob Putnam has, has called it. Uh, this is basically the value of our, of our relations, yeah? the value of our relations with, with friends and family, but very much, of course, our professional relationships, our, our professional networks, something like the digital economist. Uh, then, of course, we have health capital. This is something we, um, we certainly we, we care about a lot, uh, even more in, in the current time of, of a pandemic, but it, is, it, is, it has been notoriously difficult to put a value on that, of course. Um, but everybody understands that, I mean, health, if your health capital is poor, uh, many other possible assets that you hold or, or may hold in the future are com compromised. Uh, if your health is, is poor, uh, you, you, you cannot do much work and you, you cannot build, uh, you cannot build uh, your other assets, be it the educational capital or financial assets. So this is very foundational and it must be something very important, but it has been notoriously difficult to put a value on it. So I think we need to make some progress here. So both on the social capital and on the health capital. Educational capital is a bit better. We have much more data here, especially in countries uh, like the US where uh, people uh, take out uh, huge loans to to go to college. So uh, we have some some hard figures here to um, to estimate educational capital, at least from the basis of what people have invested on the education debt side and what people get as an excess return based on their investment. So this is something probably we can uh, we can measure quite uh, quite uh, quite well. So this is just uh, to give a first idea of what this balance sheet could look like. Now I have some reflections here how actually modern economic theory ha ha has started catching up with uh, overcoming this, this blockage and, and contradiction that um, uh, you know, uh, utility was a central concept in, in economic theory, but actually it cannot be observed and measured. And at the same time, trade between individuals is actually motivated by people being very different. But we have started to measure the economy as uh, just a scaling up of, 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 one, of one representative agent. But there is a problem because people actually want to trade because they are different. But then you cannot measure the economy just as one person being scaled up. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't kind of work. And actually, uh, on this slide, I have put together a, a, a number of uh, um, hallmark uh, seminal contributions that actually have started to address this contradiction and have actually shown that very much the difference of people is uh, one of the main motivations for trade. So we, we don't have time to go into that, but maybe if, if there are questions later on, we can do that. Okay, so let's uh, sk skip forward a bit. So basically when you, talk, when you talk about things like social capital, health capital, educational capital, you could ask uh, nasty questions like, can a CEO be worth uh, 200 times uh, 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 an ordinary employee? And there, I would say, well, yes, uh, it depends on, uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the network and the industry. 
uh, and and probably the, the the discussion today of uh, of executive remuneration is 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 probably suffering from the lack of measurement. Yeah, um, CEOs are are put too much in a in a, in, a, in a category where actually you should that there would be ways according to to our uh, methodology here to to look you know which ceo is really worth so much more and and which ceo actually uh, not so uh, for for get, for having a, a better view on these kind of questions what social capital means in, in in monetary terms in dollar terms in euro terms we meet we need to make uh, progress uh, uh, in measuring these um, intangible assets and um, certainly the internet uh, based economy has been um, has been creating particularly asymmetric e ecosystems of contracts what that, what do i mean here by that i mean this is something that i think um, in the in the in the um, in the, it, this is very much a, a question that is at, at, the, at the center of the of also of the digital economist is um, that the ambition uh, and the vision of the internet-based economy was to, to create opportunity for the greatest number uh, of, of, of people, of users, of, of, of entrepreneurs, of innovators. But over the last 20, 30 years, the internet was opened for commercial use in 92. The internet has created an, a, a very asymmetric power distribution and it has, it has created um, more unequal uh, opportunities than many other industries. And uh, it has, on this on this account, very much failed to live up to its its, its aspirations uh, when it was when it was launched, uh, which is why we, we need to create a better internet and uh, and a more open and uh, um, uh, a more uh, an internet really an internet of opportunity. Uh, so here I, I just uh, put as a as an ex a demonstration of this point uh, is uh, on the left hand side you see basically. Uh, the, the network uh, property of a, uh, a supply chain network. So a, a car industry, for example, producing a car, you see that uh, customers and suppliers, uh, they do not look so much different in terms of their capability to, to connect with each other. Whereas when you look at something like the Airbnb network, this is based on real Airbnb data, um, you see that, um, there, the internet, the internet-based economy, uh, Uber would 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 look uh, probably very similarly, and and, and other internet-based uh, economies. Um, there, the 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 supply side and the and the and the demand side, if you want, or here the the hosts and the and the and the, the, the customers, um, they they do not have the same power in the network. Yeah. Although uh, the, the the users can review the host and they they have some power uh, to to influence uh, the, the the value of the asset that the, that the host is holding, the 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 network is has a power structure that is very very uneven and uh, the, the the user is 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 nevertheless you know much much smaller compared to the to the host in, in here and this is a power measure here. And uh, contract networks, of course, are very tricky because uh, when you look at the probability to connect, so you have here um, a number of, of agents in the economy and, and you have a probability that any, any two of those agents uh, write a contract together, uh, networks create very quickly, uh, very dense and, and, and complicated structures. And uh, this is not a linear process. So actually, when the probability to to connect or to, to write a contract together increases uh, uh, just a little bit, um, networks change very very rapidly. They are um, they are basically their power properties, and this is something that was not um, well understood for a long time. Um, Actually, today we are learning this the hard way because this is exactly what happens in the in the in the in the COVID pandemic. Yeah. So in the COVID pandemic, we are learning that one percent uh, is a lot. Uh, a tenth of a percent is something where not so much happens still. With one percent, it is very very dynamic, and 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 people connect very quickly with each other. You see basically that also that in the internet economy. You, you do not really have these nicely shaped degree distributions. You have very extreme 
shapes of degree distributions, which just says in statistical terms, you have very strong asymmetrically the asymmetric power distributions yeah, in those networks. So basically what we want to, and uh, I will soon come to an end because the time is, is advancing very quickly. What we want to look at is uh, we want to better understand how people connect with each other, write contract with each other to come to better measurements of the values of those assets we are interested in on the balance sheets like the social capital, like the educational capital, like the health capital. Because we know that if we cannot complete those balance sheets, we can never really challenge uh, the income flow view of GDP. And it is not so much that we want to get rid of GDP, actually not. GDP must be a, a rate of return on assets. So in the audience, I, I, I think we have some, some practitioners and entrepreneurs. So I don't have to explain to you what a rate of return on assets and the rate of return on, on equity means. But this is what GDP should be, right? It should be the rate of return on our assets. But since we have not measured our assets properly, uh, we actually do not know what, what these assets are. And we cannot actually say if the GDP flow that we observe, the income flow, is good or not. Is it high or is it low? Is it too low? Is it too high? Um, this, is, this is really a problem. In, in economic, in theoretical uh, terms, this is, this is called observational equivalence. The income flow that we observe uh, in, in currently as GDP is observationally equiv equivalent with uh, an unlimited number of possible balance sheets. And we just cannot say if the observed income flow is high or low. Should it be higher? Should it be lower? We don't know. It's like a state-run uh, power plant that makes just, that breaks just even, makes a very, very small profit. But because you don't measure the asset and there's corruption and so on, uh, you don't know what the income actually should be. So you see that it just breaks even, but actually it should make a profit of 5 billion a year. You see, this is the problem we have with GDP. And uh, so we, we, need, we need to model an economy where people can connect with each other, they can write contracts to each other. We want to be realistic. So we will model the economy as something where people who have already a lot of contracts are more likely to write yet another contract. Yeah, so we built in this asymmetric power distribution. And we also want people to be able to stop contracts to end contracts or even go out of business yeah so something like like uh, bankruptcy or or, or or voiding a contract and when we get there i think we can hopefully say much more about this this balance sheet maybe i leave the other points because this is a very important question where comes the data from and how would people be willing to share the data that allows us to say uh, something more about the contractual structure of our economy. We can leave that for the, the Q&A. And um, maybe also for the Q&A, then I will leave this picture here, which is basically a use case that we look at in this project, uh, which looks at the Airbnb data. And you see how uh, the current uh, pandemic has changed uh, the network of, uh, of, of the Airbnb uh, network. And we can, we can maybe um, go into more detail also during Q&A. And I stop here for in the interest of time and to leave time for questions and, and answers. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Arl, for that. Um, very interesting. And I think it's equally thought provoking for our audience and uh, attendees here, uh, and by the way, please uh, please list your questions in the chat function. Uh, we'll be consolidating those and asking those to Harold. Uh, so at this point, Harold, thank you again. I would like to introduce uh, Arvinder, who is our um, program manager for the Entrepreneur and Training Program, uh, most of whom are joining us today uh, on this webinar, and also the Entrepreneur in Residence uh, in the large uh, the digital economist ecosystem. So Ravinder, please feel free to take it away from here uh, for, for the fireside chat with Harald. Uh, thank you so much, Navroop. Uh, and Harald, um, that was uh, um, yeah, that was very thought-provoking, some of the ideas that you introduced in your conversation. 
uh, is social capital as a measure. Um, and, uh, you know, I think another question that, that uh, makes us think about other measures, other macroeconomic measures uh, that many of times are kept out of the conversation, for example, you know, the physical and the mental health of, uh, you know, the citizens, um, you know, how, you know, countries should look at it. Um, also, I think you raised a very interesting point, which was about um, the diversity measure. And, uh, you know, I would like to hear a little bit more about it, given that, you know, the, the current, uh, you know, group of people that we're talking to are very diverse. They are from all across the world. Uh, one of the um, stories I read about New York and how New York became an industrial hub in the early 1900s, it was very much fueled by this uh, diversity of immigrants that came from all across and wanted to do, you know, contracts and business with each other. Uh, and so how do you see, you know, countries looking at, given that the world is becoming more and more diverse, how do you look at, you know, that macroeconomic, you know, measure of diversity as, you know, something which might be counted, you know, uh, as one of the contributors of how do you look at projection of the growth of a particular country or a region? Yeah, very very good question. So uh, I think diversity is, a, is 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 maybe the example where uh, that shows how our current uh, way of modeling economy is just not uh, is just not fit for for the job. <clears throat> so because when you just look at um, at, uh, at, at income flows, it, it just does not tell the story. So as I, I put down uh, a few examples in the slides uh, how economic theory has, has tried to, has started to, to address the, uh, the, the, um, the, the diversity as a, as a motivation for trade. For example, if you take search, uh, search theoretic models, which are among the, the younger, the, the more recent contributions of, of theory, you have basically not a representative agent as uh, as we assume in the in the in the in in, in, in GDP, but um, you have, um, for example, three different agents, right? And they and they are have different um, they have different uh, um, production technology, but also um, asset storage technology. For example, um, you could very well think that. Um, think of the, the globalization between 1990 and, 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 and now, where um, you have on the one hand, uh, economies open up to the world economy with, with significantly lower labor costs than, uh, than uh, in, in Europe or, or, or the US. Um, but on the other hand, uh, Europe and, and the US continuing to have uh, significantly lower uh, costs of contracting. Yeah, because uh, we you have um, you have um, very strong property rights. Uh, it is it is quite cheap to enforce a contract, especially in in in, in English law, uh, but also in 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 U.S. law, particular the law of uh, of New York. And uh, so you see, uh, diversity here is is really driving the trade. You, you know, uh, the production side. Is, has, has, has moved large parts of the production to, uh, to, to China and, and, and Southeast Asia. Uh, whereas uh, the, the, the financing side of, of, of a transaction has actually continued to grow in financial centers such as New York and, and, um, and London, because there the relative cost of contracting is lower. Yeah, so it, 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 very often the story about globalization that is told is, is, is way too simple. There is not just one type of cost, like the, the cost of labor to produce a t-shirt. There are many different costs that matter in the economy, and the cost of contracting is certainly one of the most important ones. And um, uh, in, in my view, for example, China will have um, a very difficult time to, uh, to, to catch up uh, or to compete uh, with, uh, with Western types of, of, of jurisdictions uh, on the cost of contracting, because you simply do not have the same type of rule of law, right? Uh, so I think here um, is the opportunity, of course, for small uh, democracies like Singapore, uh, South Korea, and Taiwan uh, next to Japan. And, uh, and you see that countries compete on a range of, of costs with each other. Uh, it is not just the cost of production. It, this is too simple. It is just because Adam Smith has not really had any 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 really any good data 
to 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 you know to speculate more about these other types of costs. What he had, that, what he put his finger on is um, the, the the strong lowering of costs in production thanks to specialization, and this this is the part that has become most famous. But at the same time, um, um, you have, uh, um, for example, what is also interesting in Smith is um, he was certainly uh, a very English person in the sense that um, England was very actively managing its, its, its trade relationship with other nations. And England, England was by far not a laissez fair nation, quite the contrary. France was actually a laissez fair nation. England was very carefully looking uh, how they protect their assets back home. So uh, basically, they were, uh, they were putting high tariffs on, on, on goods of strategic importance and, and low, basically zero, uh, on, on goods where they wanted to benefit from lower costs in other jurisdictions. And this is the way they, they, they did trade policy, you see. A very active management of their balance sheet, I would, I would call it. Uh, uh, whereas um, basically France were basically just let it let 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 it happen it was really less fair in the sense that it was not actively managed the, 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 the French balance sheet. So I think the the diversity discussion is incredibly important. We need to understand much better uh, how we gain from each other, and that it is never a single dimension. It is never just one cost dimension. So also economists have a responsibility here and the digital economists uh, certainly will do better than, 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 than many others and the mainstream economists before them. Economists have far too often looked at a single cost measure, uh, for example, labor costs. This is, this is not enough. Thank you, Raul. Thank you, that was, that was wonderful. Um, I think I'll take some of the questions from our audience and then I'll, I have probably more questions than if we have time that we'll come back to. Uh, so the first question I want to ask, this comes from uh, Chidi uh, Navago, who's uh, one of our EITs uh, in the entrepreneurial engineering program. So he says, uh, working at the European Commission, uh, can you tell us about one toughest situation you found yourself in? Uh, uh, which kind of situation? Uh, one of the toughest situation. Uh, very uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yes, yes, yes. Well, uh, 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 one of the toughest situations was during the financial crisis. Um, uh, so after 2007, eight, um, I, I, I was working with, um, uh, together with, uh, with, with, uh, with a team of, of the International Monetary Fund. And uh, we, we were um, um, uh, basically going to some of the countries that were most strongly hit by the sudden stop in financial markets and it, it was it was a very tough time because we it was really learning on the go uh, we had to uh, we had to come to a to a solid interpretation of the data as it as it happened uh, including including uh, uh, data that is uh, that is uh, of a, that is confidential that for example only the central bank see uh, normally and uh, it, it was it was really tough. Uh, it, it meant very long working days. Uh, I remember we just counted the the hours of sleep. So we just tried to get four hours of sleep every day because it was kind of the minimum to get through the next day. And uh, it, it was it was quite a tough moment. But of course, uh, it, it's it's one of these times where you learn a lot about uh, about the economy, and you also learn a lot what you did not know. I mean, you understand. A lot, <laughs> what you did not know, and you 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 discover a lot of things that you would like to understand better. Yeah. Uh, our next question comes from Ranjini Shridhar. Uh, she asks, uh, "What are some ways in which we can reduce the financial risk uh, in the um, in the current macroeconomic environment? That is high uh, debt to GDP ratios, extreme inequality, and high levels of personal indebtedness, especially in the U.S." Yes, yeah, that's that, that's an that's an excellent question. I mean, this is exactly what we would like to have in the balance sheet approach. Yeah, so basically, um, the 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 current uh, approach to to measuring the economy in GDP, which measures income flows, is completely ignorant of risk. There is no way to measure risk here. Um, in the balance sheet, uh, what you would do is, of course, uh, uh, an approach that that companies already use. So this is totally risk based. Yeah, so you basically you measure assets, of course, as the uh, infinite infinite discounted sum of uh, of uh, so this discounted sum of, of future cash flows, 
and it must be adjusted for risk. Yeah. So uh, this is why this is one of the reasons why the switch to a balance sheet approach would be so important. For example, um, I wrote an article uh, some years ago when I started this project uh, um, in the European Commission, where uh, I tried to um, open up people's mind and colleagues' mind a, a little bit for uh, a fact that nothing really is is, is 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 for free when you come when you when you when you count correctly. For example, if you live longer, if your life expectancy increases for you, due to a medical process, for example, uh, we, we have better technologies uh, to, to treat cancer and, and all kinds of things, you increase in a balance sheet approach, you increase your longevity risk. That is the risk that you end up at a later stage in your life without any assets uh, uh, that, that create any income. Yeah. So the longer you expect to live, the, the, the actually the more you need to save or you need to to invest probably in, in the balance sheet approach, I would rather say not necessarily hoard a lot of money, but invest actually in your social capital, because it will be the strength of your network that will determine your well-being when you are 80, 85, uh, 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 much more than any amount of money you have in the bank, because uh, money gets you only so far. Very good question. So this is really what we care about. We want to get uh, the full, the basic, the full power of, of modern finance, of, of the financial economics in, in the measurement of the economy, uh, uh, in, in contrast to this very uh, unproductive approach uh, that was built on, the, on this concept of uh, individual utility, which is a, which is a to totally empirically empty concept. And, uh, and, and, and unfortunately, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Bob Merton and, and, and other scholars, uh, since the early 1970s, we have developed all the, 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 the language and the tools that we need in, 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 in modern finance to, to formulate basically the, 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 these, these, uh, these measures. We know how to measure this. We now have to exploit big data and, and, and the digital representation of assets to also get to the actual values. But we know how to formulate it in the balance sheet. We know how to do that. We know how to get risk into, in there. Well, that's a very thought-provoking idea on, on you know, looking at an investment as you look at longevity. Um, our next question comes from uh, Varun Singhi, who asks, how does regulatory bodies strike the balance while regulating emerging technologies such as blockchain, artificial intelligence, without stifling innovation? Uh, yeah, this is, this is a question I have really in my everyday job. Um, so I, 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 give you, I give you my personal view, which, which, how, which is not so far away from, 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 uh, from what we try to do in, 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 in the commission. And I'm, I'm, I'm directly involved in, in this area. So uh, on artificial intelligence and uh, um, blockchain, I was one of the first pe people in the commission joining the space uh, in, in 2014. Maybe, maybe I, I, I leave a, a side remark on the, on the blockchain and tokenomics actually. Um, so on uh, on things like artificial intelligence, um, what uh, what what is very dear to me is to constantly remind, and we currently we, we just have um, a big um, uh, exercise ongoing on um, on compliance costs. So basically, uh, trying to measure what um, uh, uh, various types of possible future regulations of artificial intelligence. Um, would mean in terms of compliance costs for individual businesses. And the point that I keep insisting on uh, in, 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 this, in this area is that um, artificial intelligence is a general purpose technology. So uh, all kinds of industries use it and or want to use it, but are using it already, uh, to, 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 to be honest, and, and will, will use it more in the future. And because it's a general purpose technology used in all kinds of industries and not just like you know, algorithmic trading in the financial sector, where we know how the financial sector is regulated, but all kinds of industries, we must bear in mind that whatever we do in terms of regulation, for some industries, this will be basically a jump from zero compliance cost to, to 100, whereas from other, for other industries, it will just be a, a, a jump from 99 compliance cost to 100. So for some industries, this will be a huge step, step change, uh, and, and really a challenge. For some industries, it will be a very small step. So this heterogeneity uh, uh, is very important to keep in mind. And we, we not only look at proportionality from 
the point of view of the size of a business. So we don't want to burden uh, small and, and micro businesses found where basically the, the business consists of the founder and, 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 his, and, and, and his, his boyfriend or girlfriend and, and the friend. Uh, many tech startups, of course, start like that. And then, and then uh, small, small businesses with maybe uh, the three or five first, uh, first paid employees um, we don't want to burden uh, the, the most innovative businesses that just basically have an idea that they run with. Uh, we, we also don't want to, um, we don't want to um, um, necessarily introduce a huge amount of regulation in sectors that have not required uh, very much regulation so far and have, uh, have functioned well with, with the level of, of, of regulation that they have. So this is, this is something that we yeah we we care a lot about and um, um, the I think from look from the outside probably we 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 look very much as as a as a huge as a, as a policy institution that is all about regulation and we want to produce ever more regulation but actually in the inside there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of hard thinking and discussion going on how we can uh, avoid introducing regulation that is not. Uh, when not actually is not conducive to producing better results for for citizens and for for businesses alike. Yeah, I think uh, that 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 leads to uh, me to my next question, uh, which is you mentioned that internet as a asymmetric power distribution uh, system, and um, you know one of the perception out there is that anybody you know on the internet anybody can create a you know software, and so it's um, the opportunity is equal, but it is not given. Uh, the the cost of the software is is becoming, uh, you know, uh, it's 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 becoming more and more in some case spaces and other spaces like you know AI it's becoming easily accessible but then you have other components uh, such as compliance and other things that are that have started to you know um, happen in there. So how do you think? What are the things that uh, you know the leaders in the space or uh, the policymakers in the space can do to make Internet as a more, um, you know, sort of a, a balanced playing field uh, for all different parties and developed and non-developed yeah. as well. Yeah. So, yeah, very important question. This is a lot about uh, access to data. Yeah, because although, um, um, of course, some data sets have bec become public in the meantime. Um, uh, it, it is not. It is not. It is still. It is still not enough. And we know that access to data is the, is the critical point where we can we can not level. I would not say level the playing field. This this is, this would be too uh, this would be an exaggeration. But at least give um, give innovative startups the, the the opportunity to 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 enter the space. Um, the, the 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 large networks running large applications like 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 fa Facebook and, and 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 even even Zoom that we are using right now for this. Uh, for this, uh, for this, this webinar is, is is growing very very rapidly. Of course, the the large applications they are sitting on a, a, a treasure trove of, of of data, and they have a they have an advantage. So uh, we have a, 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 a our general policy approach is towards open software and open data. Yeah, so that that data is more and more shared. And here, I think actually there is some there is some uh, real uh, uh, tangible hope uh, on 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 the on the horizon. Uh, in the context of my project, I, I presented a, a, about a month ago, um, more than a month or mid September, in a large uh, international uh, two day uh, conference uh, uh, in the in the contract management industry. And in my talk, there were 100 uh, contract management practitioners in the room, and I asked them, uh, under what conditions are, would you be willing to share your most valuable data, the value of your contractual relationships, the value that you have with your suppliers and your customers? Under what, under what circumstances would you be able to, would you be willing to share this with, with a third party? And I gave three options, basically. The, the most restrictive one uh, is the status quo, where basically you only produce official statistic uh, based on um, on the, on the random survey uh, and and the data is is of course to, to totally um, uh, anonymous or de-identified and and it's just a it's just a random sample and there's no link to you know any any company or any industry there's there's, there's it, it, it just produces a statistic then uh, as a second possibility to 
uh, to really give your data as open data, to make your data available as an open data. So this, this would be the other extreme. And in between, um, a, a, a third possibility um, where um, you share your data pre, um, under the condition that privacy enhancing or privacy preserving technologies are, are used that, um, that allow basically uh, something uh, that we have in uh, uh, also, what what Alex, um, Alex Pentland is is is, is pushing um, secure multi-party computation, so that you, for example, you 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 can you you keep the the features of the of the network, so you can you can still exploit the economic value that is captured in the data without having the the uh, identifiers that identify a particular customer or a particular company, right? And um, I was surprised by the outcome. So uh, only uh, three percent said uh, uh, I would uh, give it away for for everybody uh, open data. I mean that that was expected, you know. I mean could be three percent, could be one percent, you know. But half of the respondents said, al almost half of the respondents said, they would be ready to share their data uh, uh, if privacy enhancing technologies uh, were used to to in this data sharing. And that was a very good surprise because I thought maybe, you know, maybe, maybe 10, 15%, 20 great max, you know? No, actually half. And, 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 and half said uh, uh, they would uh, stay where they are with official statistics and, and random sampling, et cetera. So I think this is, this is very good news that, and we were not talking to uh, um, people, people in, in, on, on, the, on the high street uh, doing their shopping. We were talking to uh, contract management practitioners. So people, who have a very close and, and, and precise understanding uh, of, of the value of this data and, and, and what, what it means to share data on your contractual uh, network. Thank you. Um, so next question comes from Mike, uh, you know, who's part of uh, the Digital Economist. Uh, um, he asks, how, uh, how does the cost of contracting play out in the sharing economy? Um, have you looked at you know, the samples of the data, especially the Airbnb and, uh, you know, the car companies, uh, uh, the contracts are happening uh, pretty consistently. So how is, how is that playing out? Uh, I, I, at this point, I would say we don't know enough about it, unfortunately, yet. Um, because, of course, you, 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 can, you, you, can, you can get the data about uh, the actual cost of, of using the one or the other uh, uh, platform. But um, what we do not know enough about, and actually this, um, uh, this, uh, th this study is one of the first probably that we'll look into um, also a bit, unfortunately, thanks to this COVID shock, we have now a, a, a big structural break in the data where we can ask some questions to the data that, that, that otherwise are difficult to ask if you don't really have a, um, a, a big change in your, in your data. Um, we, have, uh, uh, we have not so much uh, uh, data on this uh, to, to answer this kind of question. I think there are, I, I, unfortunately, I don't know the, 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 the papers that have, uh, have been done about it. But one, of the, one of the situations where you could ask this kind of question is in the, in the, in the, um, uh, in, in, in the Uber industry, basically, because you have a competitor. So I, I, I think there are some studies comparing Uber and Lyft and to uh, analyzing the, the competition between uh, Uber and Lyft that compete with each other in the US. And once you have uh, two, uh, two similar platforms like they're competing with each other, you can ask these kind of questions. But we, we really lack this kind of uh, uh, opportunities to ask these kind of questions. For example, um, it is almost meaningless to ask a question uh, of what is the cost of contracting that determines the use of Microsoft Word. Microsoft Word is a, a world monopoly. So uh, we, 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 just, we, just, we just cannot really model this question. We would, we would first need a, 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 a serious, a serious uh, either a serious shock in the data that, that allows us to, 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 to compute uh, some, some price elasticity based on this external shock or have a, have a, have a competitor that manages to, to, uh, to get a market share in a, in a meaningful way from, uh, from, from, from Microsoft in this area. So very often, unfortunately, uh, we either did not have a, a, a massive shock to the data that, that would allow us to, to say something about uh, uh, a, a price elasticity, uh, after, after an external shock, 
or uh, you, you, you have a lack of competition uh, that does not allow you to ask this kind of question. But yes, we would like to ask this question much more often. And um, in, the, in the commission, of course, this has um, occupied us a lot in, in, uh, in competition uh, in competition cases against uh, against uh, uh, Google, Microsoft, etc., and uh, here we have uh, indeed uh, also experienced that simply looking at the price, uh, so a, a traditional price comp competition analysis does does not give you the answer. So you have to do a you have to do a very comprehensive analysis uh, that goes basically towards the direction where I would like to see us go where you look at uh, the, the question, what does this company's way of doing business do to the assets on our balance sheets? Does this create more opportunity for me as an individual? Does it increase the value of my educational asset? And where should the value of my educational asset be? Is it too high or is it too low? Because probably Google would say, um, you know, provided uh, Google search and th nice things like Scholar Google that make it much easier to find the relevant paper, et cetera, uh, my educational asset has increased in value, you know, thanks to these um, possibilities of search. But is it, has it increased where it should be? Has it just increased, but maybe not enough, you know? And where could it be if, uh, if we had, um, if we had, um, maybe more innovation in the sector or more competition. We don't know. So we have to ask very comprehensive questions of this type because simply looking at the price does not work when you have a world monopoly in a particular industry. Thank you, Harold. And uh, we have one last question. This comes from one of our attendees, uh, Jeffrey DiMarco. He asks um, around the regulation of virtual currencies. Mm -hmm. And he says, how are authorities designating uh, virtual currencies? as commodities, securities, uh, et cetera. Could you please speak on this? Yes. Yeah, okay, that, that, is, that brings me actually back to my, to my uh, what I, I still wanted to say something about the tokenomics. So um, the, um, the real question is not, is, not a, is not securities and commodities, certainly not in, in Europe. Um, this, is a, this is a very US-based uh, US question because uh, of the way the US regulates securities. Um, in, in the European uh, uh, context, this is much less relevant uh, if, it's, if it is a security or, uh, or, or a commodity. What is relevant here is, is, uh, is, is, is actually the much more important question. How can we overcome the, the current conflict between uh, the, 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 the possible benefits uh, of a digital representation of assets and the, 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 the omnipresent need to have those representations be as tradable as possible. This is, this is the conflict that has held back the, 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 the economic space over until now. Because when you concretely launch a, a cryptocurrency or any form of digital representation of assets, how you launch it is to make it fungible and tradable as quickly as possible with, with, with already existing uh, uh, digital currencies or, or digital assets. This is the way you launch it. If you're not tradable, you, 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 you just don't get off the ground. But making it very fungible and tradable compromises actually your, your potential to be a, a very good representation of an asset. Because a representation of an asset is something that, is, that, is, that must be protected against copy, okay? And being protected against copy, it must it must be unique, and there is a misunderstanding in the in the, in the cryptocurrency space. Being unique does not simply mean you have a you have a hash that cannot be tampered with. This is not enough. It must be unique in the sense that it's actually it is difficult to trade it. Look, go back to the go back to the um, go back to the um, um, to the to the balance sheet approach. You're not allowed to trade your educational asset. Your educational asset is part of you. You can only write a contract with a company that where you agree free will. Uh, you agree to not uh, allow other companies, in particular competitors of, of, of the company you are uh, you're signing a contract with, to benefit from your educational asset. 
this is all you do. You're not trading your <laughs> educational assets. And the cryptocurrency space has not, very often has not understood this trade-off. You cannot have it both. You cannot have a perfectly fungible tradable asset uh, 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 like a cryptocurrency, which is fine. A cryptocurrency is fine. You want it to be fungible and to, to exchange against uh, as many other pairs of other cryptocurrencies as possible. But you will lose on the representation of the asset. This is a, this is a trade off. You must decide what you want to do. And once you go for the, for the representation of the asset, you, 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 you model this uniqueness of an asset, um, you of course run into the, into the really hard problem because you have to bake in this representation of the asset into a, into a business process to make it really productive. And we come back to the, to the Hume quotation and to, and, to, and, to, and to comments. The value is created by the, the interaction of this, of this asset with other assets, with other people with other uh, physical assets, you know? And the digital representation can increase the value of your asset by facilitating this interaction. But interaction is not the same as bilateral trade, like two cryptocurrencies. Bilateral trade means you swap your inventory. I give you Bitcoin and you give me Ether in return. We swap inventories. Uh, uh, this, is not, this is not working with an asset. So you can you you, you an asset an, an asset stays with you, especially your physical, uh, especially your your social capital, your educational capital, your 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 health capital. You cannot swap it with somebody else. I cannot give you my health and exchange it for your health. Would in some cases would be nice, but doesn't work. It's not possible. <laughs> not not in our human condition. So this is something that has so far not been properly understood in the, in the, in the crypto space. Uh, it had, there has been a shortcut of just, uh, you know, it's, it's sufficient that we can, that we can uh, make the trace not possible to tamper with, yeah? With, with private public key and, 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 and hash. Not enough, not enough. The productivity does not come from there. The productivity comes from the interaction with other assets. And assets are very different from the currency. We must distinguish here really what we're looking at. Either we look at the, the, the payment and the, and, the, and the flows, the monetary side, or we look at, 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 at the asset side. And, and this has been too much mixed up and, and not, not well understood. Thank you so much, Harald. Uh, those were some, some, some amazing thought-provoking ideas on you know, the balance sheet approach uh, you know, to representation of all you know, different assets. Um, and also, I think uh, you, know, you brought some very good points around Know, the macro indicators that you know we should look at going forward in the you know the you know in the in the, in the digital world that is knocking on our door um and how to look at you know the assets like social capital and network uh some very very thought-provoking ideas uh and thank you so much for taking the time you know to join and i'm sure that our attendees gained uh you know quite a lot from this conversation we had a lot more questions but you know the time was limited so there were so I apologize for the questions that I could not take. Um, I would encourage, you know, our participants, our attendees to, uh, you know, visit our website, uh, thedigitaleconomist.com. And, you know, we have, uh, you know, uh, some policy papers that we uh, continuously put out on, you know, variety of different things from inequality to entrepreneurship. Um, and so you, you can go there and read, uh, you know, uh, our, our papers. Um, also, uh, you know, just wanted to mention uh, that this is a part of an ongoing speaker series that we do every Friday, 7 a.m. Uh, Pacific. And so we uh, encourage to go on the website, register for our upcoming events. Um, and we would like to, you know, um, have other continue uh, to have conversations with, with thought leaders in the space. You can also follow us on, on our social media, on LinkedIn, um, on, our, on our Twitter. And if you have any questions, uh, you know, regarding this conversation or regarding our future uh, speaker series, you can um, email us at info at the digital And uh, in the last, I would say, you know, if you have a particular speaker that you would like to hear from, uh, please nominate, uh, you know, the speaker and you can do so by reaching out on a social media or reaching directly to us. Harold, thank you so much for, for taking the time to talk to us and we hope that we should be, we would be able to bring you uh, for uh, you know, uh, in one of our future events. 
and would love to learn more about you know from uh, about you know the work that you do and from your experiences at the European Commission. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Navroop, any last words? That's uh, that's pretty much everything, Carl. Thank you, and uh, I think it's very exciting. Um, and I would encourage everyone, again, uh, just like Avinder said, to explore this more. I think that rethinking needs to happen, speaking from an economist uh, perspective, and that's very much the mission of the digital economist as well. Uh, properly accounting for the digital economy is one of the underlying themes that I was hearing throughout. Um, you know, and, and I think that has brought to fore the, the urgency of this, um, which something we were just comfortable with and just kind of using GDP as a measure over the past decades um, uh, kind of needs to go away. It's, it's a big undertaking. It's not, it's not gonna be easy. Uh, there's this entire infrastructure, but I think um, that's where the young, young leaders come in, right? If we have enough uh, momentum, enough, um, you know, um, enough people, we reach that inflection point where things start to change. And I think, Harold, uh, you're leading the charge in that. So uh, congratulations on the tremendous work that you're doing. And we look forward to engaging uh, ourselves further uh, and perhaps support some of the commission's work, but also invite everybody here who's watching this uh, webinar to, to join there as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.